we should build free non-profit supply lines for complicated medications. And it might... <laughs> Well, there you go. You heard it here, guys. Just, just build free non-profit supply lines for medications. And that's not a free market solution. That is a reputation-based system. Oh, they just literally did. Oh, it's literally, it's literally the thing. It's literally the demon moment thing. It's literally the, well, if you make bad products, then nobody will want to buy from you anymore. So you will go out to business. So therefore you're going to make good products. Like it's. Oh, I'm sure it was somewhat ableist, but also uh, like, I think I was matching the tone pretty well. <laughs> Let's have an independent fact check. Let's run through this claim. At timestamp 3 hours, 33 minutes, and 30 seconds in, uh, Demon Mama says to Vosh, and I quote, You're just being a fucking c Guys, here's the hot take. Ready? Okay, Ready for I'm, Okay, I'm- 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 Okay, hold on, guys. <laughs> now we're about to get the hot take, okay? I'm holding Hottest on. Hottest hot take of all? You okay. ready? Are you fucking ready? I'm ready. Here we- here- here- here we go. I'm ready! So, uh, a few days ago, maybe it was a week by now, Vosh and Demon Mama had a debate regarding supply chains and medication, and that debate went as it went. Fairly interesting. I didn't do a reaction, uh, you know, per se. I watched it privately. But then we put out this banger video right here, which is my most popular video on my channel ever. Um, so it did really well, which was edited by Zoe, very nicely so, uh, in which we talk about a bit uh, the kind of strategies that, um, that Demon Mama uses to avoid answering questions a lot. And it's, it's a good video. It's a banger. You should check it out. Uh, also, thank you to Sad Boy, um, I think, uh, on Reddit, who, who wrote out that post. Uh, they were credited at the beginning of the video as well. But yeah, great stuff. Since then, Dean Mama came back and she streamed... When did she stream? She streamed two days ago. And she's doing some reflection, some, some retrospective analysis on, uh, on that debate and how it went. So without further ado, we're going to watch that and we're going we're gonna to give our thoughts. Now. You know it's going to be good when it starts with the sigh, when it starts with the... That's how you know you're going to get some real high quality content. Let's begin. If you all are interested, we can talk about what the, what the conversation could have been had if instead it wasn't about jumping on a dog pile and trying to determine me as an abusive person over a tweet. Which, boy oh boy, doesn't that feel a little hypocritical? Doesn't that feel like just a little hypocritical to like do the tweet canceling thing from Vosh, the guy who's been canceled over his, was actively being canceled over a tweet? Come on. Let's talk about the actual subject at hand, okay? Let's do it, shall we? You all, you all interested? You all interested in what we're talking about? Sure, let's fucking talk about it. So I've been thinking about this. I've, believe it or not, been reading about this. And in fact, Doe has also been reading about this and sharing lots of stuff with me. I do not believe that. But anyway, we, we have a bit of the beginning already. How um, you have this narrative where Dima is saying that that entire thing was just people kind of like trying to railroad her into a specific position, not giving her time to speak. Vosh was handling her with kid gloves in that discussion. Um, she was given a platform in front of probably tens of thousands of people, at least at this point, hundreds of thousands of people probably, to clarify positions of this, where Vosh is pretty handoff and was just asking basic questions to get answers. And you could elaborate on your take however you wanted to. Uh, so this entire narrative that, oh, you know, they just came out there to blow me up on a tweet. Trust me, if Vosh wanted to blow you up on the tweet, he would have done it very differently. It would have been more similar to how we did with, for example, that debate way back uh, with Mel, Chaos Mel. If he wanted to do that, he was being extraordinarily nice to Demon Mama here and trying to just like give her the time to speak and to clarify her positions. Unfortunately, Demon Mama does not answer questions, so that never came to pass. But yeah, so this this narrative, we're going to see a lot coming up now. Just keep in mind that that's not at all what happened. Which feels fucking sick as fuck. So let's actually talk about what I was talking about here, okay? So what I was trying to talk about is the fact that as it currently stands, the world, medicine as we know it, the, the medical institutions, the way that we get drugs, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, medicine. God, <laughs> when you know it, it's just so obvious. It's how many random words just get thrown in here to just make it sound more. Like you can see just like the medical, as it stands today in the modern world, the medical institutions, our medicines, the way that we distribute resources in order to assist with our physiology. Like, Jesus. Medicine is entirely built on top of the profit motive. You understand that? We have insurance we have privatized we have patent ownership by pharmaceutical companies we have production owned by those pharmaceutical companies you have no way to access medicine besides getting a job and paying for the medicine or getting a job so you can get insurance to pay for the medicine i think she's talking, obviously american perspective here let's be honest there are plenty of other countries that have very 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 different and much more you know less kind of 
still profit driven to some extent, depending on what specific model we're talking about, but absolutely less like, you know, really hard line. Hey, if you don't have the money, you don't get medicine than what the US does. Hey, you're definitely like other countries with better public health care system, like you find in the Nordics or other parts of Europe or whatever. So this is from an American centric perspective, which is very important for what we're about to hear later. So just remember that because she kind of stated it before is like what we have around the entire world is that when, you know, there are definitely systems or societies that have gone around this and that do medicine in a very different way than what she's describing here. If you're lucky, you might live in a state that has Medicare or Medicaid and you might be able to get on one of those, but that is not a guarantee. And those are what those do is just have the government pay the private corporations for the medication. So, um, so it's a little bit fucking, you know, so, so, so that's the, that's the start point. That's where we're at right now. And in a world where everything is locked behind money, um, medicinally is locked behind money. You might go, well, then maybe I should do it myself. And you go, well, damn, medicine is very complicated. Yes, it is. But if you can't afford it, you don't have anything else. And if you're in pain or you're dying and you still don't have money and you're in pain or dying, you might not be able to get money. So what happens when you are the one who is cut out of the currently existing supply lines? Odd. Now we're in a different circumstance, are we? What do you do if you don't have the money to pay for your life-saving medication? You have a couple of options. You either steal it. You either find a miracle way to get that medication legitimately. You make it yourself or you buy it on the gray market. And gray markets are often, interestingly, uh, qualified drug producers in other countries who sell these things via technically not legal routes. Technically not legal. Sounds like a weird way of saying illegal. But yeah, anyway. So I understand the process that, that Dima Mama is, is talking about here. And this is even something she talked about in the Bosch debate. But what she's done here effectively is she's taken her original position and, or like her original tweet and her language is there. And then she's kind of been like, oh, you know, I mean, you know, and I've thought about it a bit more now. This is what I was saying all along, which isn't true. There's an aspect to this is, is like defensible. So for instance, uh, you know, Dima Mama been asked Bosch about this in the debate. It was like, hey, so if somebody like, you know, in the in the 50s, you know, AIDS is going, you know, circling around and uh, killing people. If you are a person who's going to get affected by AIDS or has AIDS, should you engage in experimental practices? Obviously, the answer to that is yes, because otherwise you don't have a death sentence. That's not, you know, an entirely incorrect position to have. But also what the mama is saying is a lot more. She's skipping over a lot of the other things that are all of the really important things that you can do to make medicine more accessible for a lot of people by going straight kind of to, okay, we need like Breaking Bad-esque drug labs where you go and collect all your chemist friends or whatever uh, and, you know, you make medicine, which is a terrible prescription or terrible thing to just suggest and just throw out. There's like, hey, by the way, uh, if you, you know, are having trouble with, you know, with like any types of medication, really, just, you know, go in and do a, a Breaking Bad like thing, you know, in an RV or whatever. And she didn't clarify this sufficiently during her debate with Bosch, if this was what she truly believed all along. So I think this is a bit of like a afterwards, she's like, okay, what's a, what's a defensible, what's a savable aspect I can take of this? And now I can defend it publicly here. And I think that's what's going on right now. Okay. So, isn't this the plot for Breaking Bad? Uh, no, because the dip Yes and no. <laughs> uh, in Breaking Bad... I just, I, just self, I love to say we're on on Twitch politics, where, where somebody can say, aren't you advocating for basically Breaking Bad? <laughs> and they're like, well, yes and no. <laughs> it's just, we're just in a, we're in, a, we're in a funny place right now, guys. He, he has cancer, and he sells it to make money to pay for cancer meds. So, yes, there is a certain amount of truth in Breaking Bad, but I don't appreciate the Breaking Bad things because he was cooking meth. It doesn't cure cancer. Anyway. <laughs> so the difference is that the, the thing that's being made, not all the issues with the production process and the safety concerns of that. Ah, whatever. We'll just, we'll just keep moving. Okay, here we go. We got it. Danny Fallon says, okay, because I'm autistic, I went back and I, I went back to the Voshvod. You called into contention what he was saying about rural doctors not getting meds. He went to pee. A chatter suggested you be brought on. He then offered to let you on. You asked to be brought on because chatters were spamming you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so... So what the chat was pointing out is it's not the narrative of like Vosh going in there to blow up her over this tweet that she didn't get to word properly because of the character limit on Twitter. And this person is pointing out that actually, no, a chatter brought it up and then they asked if you want to come on and then you wanted to come on. And then, and then Mama does this. I, yeah, I, I don't know what a reaction this is. Let us, let us uh, continue. <laughs> now, there are some medications that are very, very, very difficult to produce. There are other medications that are not difficult to produce. Let me give some examples of this for people who are interested in this topic. An example of a medicine that is not difficult to produce is weed. Im cannabis is one of the most effective painkillers in the world, one of the most effective painkillers, and it can be grown from the ground. Oh my God. So there's an, there's an example of a medicine that's super easy to, to DIY. Want to know what else about that medicine? It's also quite safe because there isn't a profit incentive to taint the, the weed 
And also, the effects of weed are relatively minor, so it's actually super easy to just test it and be safe. It's also super easy to cross-test. So one weed farm makes weed, tests another weed farm, and that weed farm tests the other weed farm. Oh, fuck, here we go. Yep, this is clean weed because they're doing it for the good of of, of people being able to enjoy weed. Now there we go. We got the ICAP arguments going in right off the bat. Okay, so number one, I'm gonna say okay. I don't have. I don't have a lot of, I don't have like a, a specific knowledge of weed. I did a little bit of reading for this. You know, I'm not an expert. I don't, I don't smoke. I don't do any of that. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about what, what I think is true about this topic. So um, number one, you know, ease of production is a bit mixed. Obviously it's not just like you fucking plant it in your backyard and then you need very specific equipment to make sure that, you know, it's able to grow in an optimal capacity. Uh, you need things to make sure that the ground isn't contaminated, that, you know, the growing process occurs that it should be. That was number one. Number two is that, Oh, you know, there's no incentive for somebody to like fuck with weed or whatever. There absolutely is. So there are a bunch of more cheaper alternatives to weed that exists uh, that might be laced with things or that might be the product that wasn't advertised that are cheaper to grow and that might look a bit like weed uh, that people, you know, trade around and they sell, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this is weed, by the way, but it's like a cheaper alternative that, you know, has different health consequences because it's a different fucking drug. And then thirdly, the kind of, uh, the whole, and this is something that was present in the Vosh debate as well, the idea that like, okay, well, um, you know, people are just gonna, they're gonna like vibe check each other's weed because they all just do this because of the love for making weird, a weed is just like a really naive and strange way to think about these type of things and to think about these types of drug production. We do live in a world with the profit motive. That is something that exists. We do live in a world with markets and we need to understand that we live in such world and act accordingly. There are perverse incentives that exist when it comes to stuff like this. When it comes to other weed factories, just checking others, why would we trust them to check it with one another? We already know as, you know, left-leaning people, the capacity for things like oligopolies and monopolies and stuff to form and the risk for, you know, behind the scenes collaboration between different institutions where they try to hide things from the consumer when it comes to potential risks or damages of products because they can all mutually go into that kind of like game theory like and be like, okay, well, if we all band together and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with this, then we can make a fuck ton of money and there's nobody else to really check what's going on here because there's a broader institution. And that's where government is really important. It's so where government and institutions can, are really important in stepping in there and being like, hey, um, we have oversight over this. These are the regulations we have. You need to provide us with this. We need to go and check your stuff. And this is how we're going to make sure it's okay, rather than relying on kind of independent producers to like vibe check each other when it comes to these types of things. It's a very silly thing to do. And it is an ANCAP argument. It is reminiscent to the, okay, well, we don't need government. We don't need institutions. We don't need these things because, hey, you know, if you make a bad product, then everybody's going to know that you make a bad product and then uh, people are not going to buy for you anymore and then you're going to fail. And obviously there's like 6 million different struggles with that or that other people have the goodwill of their heart are going to like step in or whatever. You know, some of them include that number one, negative health effects or negative adverse effects from the product or service may not be apparent immediately. Uh, number two, uh, consumers and, you know, producers as well uh, don't have perfect access to information about what other people think about them or whatever. Number three, there are incentives for producers to band together and engage in like, like whole scale deceit on what is going on there. Number four, there isn't always a meaningful degree of competition. You know, oligopolies and monopolies are a thing. So therefore you can't simply choose to not buy from this firm anymore if they're producing bad products because they're the only thing you have. And if you have a big demand for this thing, especially if the demand for that thing is inelastic, you're gonna be a lot of trouble. Like there are so many different issues with this lens of analysis and it is absolutely like textbook kind of, and I don't like saying this, but it's, it's very like naive and one dimensional analysis of how interactions occur in an economy or in like a, you know, like a market or whatever. It's, it's it's really strange. Now, obviously, profit motives fuck this up, but that's what we're trying to address. We're trying to get rid of the stuff that fucks it up. Now, there are other medications that are not so easy to make, okay? Some of those um, are to treat extremely, extremely niche illnesses, very, very rare illnesses that only some people have, and therefore it's difficult to produce. Now, if there is a medication that require that is very, very difficult to produce, don't you think that we should reserve special supply lines for that type of medicine? Because right now, the way it works is that capitalist supply lines control everything, including niche medicine. Now, because of the profit margin, that means that we have giant drug factories Butter. and that we have extremely stringent, highly bureaucratic drug supply lines, which cut people out who... But there is a good reason why the supply lines are stringent. We need those regulations. You know, you know, maybe it would be cool if all the like the factories just open their thing, and they just like put whatever they made on the shelves and like, hey, come in and grab whatever. I mean, maybe Dima would prefer that. But 
Unfortunately, there is a reason why we have stringency here. And the reasons for that is there are important quality controls. There are important regulations that need to take place in terms of the transportation of this. There needs to be oversight to make sure that these aren't tampered with. They need to be tested before they can be, you know, put to market. They need to blah, 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 blah. There's like a million things that need to happen. And the reasons why these things need to happen is because they're put in place in order to protect the health of the people buying it. And it does fucking suck that because of these regulations that need to be in place, lest you risk like mass you know, health crises in your nation, um, that, that some people are cut out of it. Absolutely. But the, the solution to that ought to be to go really hard and analyze, okay, what part of this process can we make better? How can we, you know, negotiate this better? Is it like a wealth issue? Is it a logistic issue? Is it like a, you know, political issue? Is it like a cultural issue? Like what's going on here? And then try to fix those solutions in order to help those people get access to the medications they need. The solution is not to advocate for people to you know, do their own, like, DIY stuff here. And especially in, like, really irresponsible and weird rhetoric that's occurring here. ...who then die from that disease. I think, as people who allege to be leftists and anarchists, that perhaps we should go, oh my god, this is a very, very bad situation for us to be in. Our This niche medicine is patented, controlled, and manufactured only by corporations, which means if you're the one who's sick, you have to pay that corporation. We should build free non-profit supply lines for complicated medications. And it might well, there you go. You heard it here, guys. Just just build free non-profit supply lines for medications. That's that's all you gotta do. Just 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 build those, just do those supply lines. Just just build those non-profit free supply lines for everybody to get free medication. It's the simplest thing in the world. Just just do anarchism. Like I okay. Obviously, the issue here is that what she's describing, to be terrible, I mean, it's it's desirable, right, to have a system like this. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these things are very difficult to get to, especially the things that she's talking about, about it being non-profit and stuff like that. Because she's obviously talking outside the realm of a government institution, which the simple answer to this is that, hey, we're getting closer to this the more we move towards, like, public healthcare systems, you know, across different nations and stuff like that. We're getting closer to a system where, you know, uh, medications are more affordable, sometimes even free, you know? Um, that's the reasonable solution. But because the mama has, like, a... She has a very large infatuation with working outside of the state always, as was present, for example, in our conversation about schools and stuff, um, that's not what we're talking about here. So what we're talking about here is, is independent organizations or whatever... Um, manufacturing and checking and validating their own drugs and their own process here, which I'm going to be honest, I don't trust that. I don't think that's a good thing to encourage. I don't think it's good to encourage a parallel market that is not regulated by large institutions with a lot of oversight, with experts working on them, with committees, with like direct chains of like legal recourse should something go wrong. I don't think this is a positive thing at all. Um, but, you know, when you have, like, a hate boner for the state, I guess this, this is what we gotta do. Might be hard to do, but we should do it, because it saves people's lives. And then the thing that Jared, uh, mentioned as well that I forgot to mention. Deem doesn't understand non-profits. No entity operates in a way that generates 0% profit. Non-profits, they generally just have a way of forming business. That is not how a business operates. Exactly. So what the difference between a non-profit is and a conventional firm, it's not that the non-profit doesn't make any revenue. That's not what it is at all. It doesn't take that out into profits. For shareholders the same way a conventional firm does. So a nonprofit still has to make money. They still need to make money for the production and the services or whatever they're offering. They still need to make money to cover all the costs for the employers, uh, the employees and people that work within the firm. They still need to make costs for potential expansions and just general business expenses that exist. They need to make all that, but then they don't take out that extra money for like share, uh, shareholders or whatever. Um, but people who work with a nonprofit can make sizable amounts of money. Especially if you know it's a difficult job or whatever, if it's one that you, there isn't a lot of like supply for laborers that can do that type of job. Um, but she, she seems to say like non profit here and free. She seems to like com conflate the two. But in reality, like looking aside the nine million things that failed before this point, if there is a non profit that is able to work and it's safe or whatever, um, that doesn't mean that the drugs are going to be free just because it's a non profit. That non profit is going to have to make money probably from, you know, a cost at the point of purchase so that they can pay for their entire process that's going on. And the way to circumvent this is, surprise, surprise, here comes our best friend again, the government. They can go in there and step in and through taxation, they can provide the funding that is needed for this so that people don't need to pay for it at the point of purchase. And it is instead paid for by the general workings of the economy that contribute to a tax pool that can then be used on such things and such expensive, uh, such expenses. But because we're, we're, we're determined to like work outside the government, 
I, I don't I don't know how this will work. I I legitimately I I do not understand uh, what what this model would look like. And we're leftists. No one ever said that we are going to delete all chemists, that we are going to delete all chemistry, that we are going to delete all factories. The factories exist already. The professionals exist already. The, the, the materials exist already. They are all being exploited by capitalism. And what I'm trying to say... Okay. How do I... Okay. Let me just... Let me think about this. Okay. Charitable. We do absolutely have some of the things in place in order to produce medicine, in order to produce these things. Now, does that mean that we can just, that can just be seized and we can then do whatever we want with it without concerns about having to make a profit furthermore? No, because cost of business is a thing. There are reoccurring costs that occurs when something happens, equipment runs out, ingredients are used, supply chains are still needed and purchases and negotiations and trades still need to be made. It's not like, okay, well, we have all these ingredients, we have these chemists, we have this factory. Uh, now we can we can cut this off from most of the things and now we can just do like a the demon mama non-profit where we can do whatever we want or we don't have to worry about bringing more money into it. That's not true because ingredients run out. You know, all these things, it, there are costs to running an operation. And um, just because you have things in place right now doesn't mean that, okay, you know, we're fine. We don't need to add anything more to that. We can remove the processes that put those things in place that allowed us to have that in the first place. Um, obviously, it's a very silly thing. You will need a new supply of chemists. You will need the new education. You will need the new training programs. You will need updated research on that. You will need updated training courses for specific type of medications or specific types of diseases or stuff that you need to be treated. For example, like COVID, it's probably a lot of more training and stuff that went into that when it comes to, you know, that coming around and everything that takes an extra cost. But yeah, just because you have something at one place doesn't mean that now you don't, that thing doesn't require continuous investment and continuous revenue in order to keep functioning. To say is, we should find ways to break down the ex ex specifically exclusive consumer supply lines and replace them with better things, some of which might not look at all like what we imagine now. And guess what? There are chemists, specialists, shipping specialists who can figure it out and do. An example of this. Oh, Did you know sense. that all over the world, there is a black market for designer drugs? I'm talking drugs that, that get you high in a way that you can only produce in a lab. Drugs which could kill you if they weren't pure. Illicit drugs are a for-profit black market industry, and yet they still manage to somehow maintain purity. And if someone makes a drug... Am I losing my mind? Because I've heard that designer drugs are really dangerous. Safety. All right. The safety of research chemicals is untested and little if any research has been done on the toxicology or pharmacology of most of these drugs. Nice. Few if any human or animal studies have been nice. Nice. Have been done. And many research compounds have produced unexpected side effects and adverse incidents due to the lack of screening for off-target effects prior to marketing. Nice. Both bromo dragonfly and methadrome seems to be capable of producing pronounced vasoconstriction under some circumstances when your blood vessels tighten. Uh, which has resulted in several deaths. Nice. Although the mechanism remains unclear. Substituted, substituted phenethyl, phenethylamines, such as the 2C family, and substituted amf, am, amphetamines, such as the DOCS family, have also caused a limited number of deaths. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know about you. I would, I would probably prefer if these things were were regulated. And we believe this, right? As, as generally, as like left-leaning people that like, hey, you know, when it comes to drug dealing and like just drug stuff in general in society, you probably have it way safer once it's been legalized and once it's operated through the state where we can put regulations and we can have people check what is going into these things and what's being done so that you don't buy things that are laced with things you don't know about. You don't buy shitty fentanyl, you know, equivalents for the drugs that you think you're, you know, having and end up overdosing on that or whatever. I don't know why why like why why off market black market things are fetishized and put up as a good thing um yeah it just it it seems incredibly strange it's way less safe than you know a lot of the the uh the legalized alternatives that exist for these drugs such as for example marijuana in the netherlands but yeah let's keep watching if it's impure unless they got it second hand from like a, a skeezy dealer guess what you know more or less who made your designer drug and you can go and take umbrage with them, and other people will as well. And that's not a free market solution. That is a reputation-based system. Oh, this is literally, dude. Oh, it's literally, it's literally the thing. It's literally the demon moment thing. It's literally the well. If you make bad products, then nobody will want to buy from you anymore. So you will go out of business. So therefore, you're gonna make good products. Like it's. 
this is not a free market thing. Let me give you the word for word verbatim arguments that ANCAPs use for why you don't need regulation. It's actually ridiculous. So once again, I'll give that I'll give the, the series of responses to to why this is a silly system. Number one, consumers don't always informed. Number two, consumers don't always make rational decisions. Number three, uh, it may take a while for you to detect the adverse incidents that have to do with the reputation and stuff like that. Number four, uh, sometimes you don't have an option whether or not you buy from somebody. There are monopolies and oligopolies that are in place that limit your choices to just go to another firm. Um, number five, there are incentives for you know different firms, different conglomerates to work together and to you know hush down like aspects of your product that may be negative in order to avoid this you know negative reputation or people not buying or whatever. But they're like. 16 million things wrong. What she's doing here, it's really funny as an anarchist, but she's engaging in like, like textbook, like neoclassical homo economicus analysis here for how this, this unregulated system is going to work. There are so many things wrong here that need regulation, that need somebody to step in, that need a mediator in order to protect the consumers. Um, yeah, I, I, man, these econ takes, I'm, I'm losing my mind. This is, this is like, I learned all this in literally high school econ. Granted, I did IB, I did economics higher level, but still, it's like, damn, like I don't understand how people that are, are talking about politics and economics all day just don't don't understand this. But I don't know, it's just it's weird to me. Which is what they most just of change the companies. Well. There's like there's nine million different things: spillover costs, environmental damage, exactly. So things like the um, the um, yeah externalities is something that is very difficult to address without uh, without what's it called regulations. Uh, the spillover effects that you mentioned. Yeah, it's like there's 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 like nine million things wrong with this lens of analysis that requires some form of government intervention. The world already runs on minor drug, and you can go and take umbrage with them, and other people will take umbrage with. I <laughs> I know Vosh said this in the debate. Is like, yeah, so uh, you know Jeff on you know he parks on you know I don't know Leaf Streets twenty three you know on his RV sometimes. Like, please, what what are we doing? like? I, I'm losing my mind. As well. And that's not a free market solution. That is a reputation-based system, which is what most of the world already runs off. No, we don't just run off reputation. There are specific checks and balances put in place. There are specific legal procedures. There are specific legal consequences. There are specific uh, investigations. There are specific inspections. There are specific policies put in place to ensure that you better do this shit. And if you don't, you can get punished for it. That's what's keeping it together. It's not the reputation that people have or drug companies have. That's not what it is at all. It, I, I guess Dima Mama doesn't think this is an ANCAP argument because I guess she already thinks we live in the ANCAP paradise. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Can you clarify the difference between bureaucracy and profit motives? Because I feel people get those mixed up. Bureaucracy, okay. When I hear, okay, the term bureaucracy refers to systems of government that are powered by unelected bureaucracy. Number one, not government. Uh, it's not only government. It can be any organizational structure. Number two, it's not just unelected. You can have a bureaucratic system, but people are democratically elected. So that's two things wrong already. Democrats who oversee loads and loads and loads of paperwork. That is what a bureaucracy is. Bureau it's not just paperwork. It's all types of managerial and like logistical organization and management. So we got three things wrong with the definition already. Democracy is not a substitute word for any form of organization or any form of, of record keeping or any form of doing your homework. Bureaucracy is typically, from my understanding, is typically referred to more like, like complex and interwoven um, types of management. But we, we'll check this out. Bureaucracy definition. System of government, which most of the important officials are by the state official, rather excessively complicated administrative procedure. Okay, so it seems like a lot of people use this to refer to government, but you can, I think you, you can call things bureaucratic, even though they aren't necessarily uh, government run. Um, structure of control for large organizations and government. Yeah. So it, it can be used for both of them. Granted, I'm not going to give it too much shit because I think most commonly people use it just for government, but it can be used for anything. Um, but it doesn't say anything about non-democratic. Um, it just, yeah, it's just like higher level complex organization uh, or organizational things going on. So, yeah, I mean, I guess like if you have a group project, you don't really have like, if you have like three people working on a project, four people, you don't really have bureaucracy there. Uh, but once you start introducing elements of like hierarchy and management, that's when you start to get bureaucracy, right? Um, and typically this word is negatively loaded uh, when it comes to, okay, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and like, uh, yeah, like the, the inefficiencies that arise there and the Kafkaesque nature of some things. But yeah. A bureaucracy is specifically designed to deal with legal bloat. The reason why the United States and the USSR are the most famous bureaucracies in the world is because we have...
I don't know what I don't know what she means when she says most famous bureaucracies in the world. I extremely inefficient, unjust legal systems that require an un and such an expensive cost. And guess what? Some corporations Okay, inefficient, unjust legal systems. They're like obviously everybody here knows that I have I have issues with the US legal system. Um and most legal systems are issues. But if we relativize things and we compare like the legal systems of today compared to the legal systems of I don't know, fucking anywhere else in human history. The legal systems of today is pretty damn good, okay? And there are very significant issues, but it's pretty damn good. Especially if you look at, for example, places like, you know, Europe or the US or whatever, which is what she's talking about. Granted, she didn't say Europe, she said the US, but even the US, it's pretty damn good compared to relatively where we've been in the past and compared to a lot of other countries, such as, for instance, China, um, that she mentions here as well. So, yeah, I, this is this is like a, a weird way of, of analyzing this as well. Um, because in a lot of ways, the legal systems we have right now are, are groundbreaking from a historical perspective. And also from an international perspective, you think of the whole world and not just, you know, like a Eurocentric or Western centric perspective. Corporations function as bureaucracies as well, because some corporations are working with the government and their employees are not elected. And they are basically pencil pushers who are in partnership with the government. So to be clear for the record, you're not saying get rid of supply chains, but rather make them better. You can't get rid of supply chains. That's like saying get rid of air. You can't. A supply chain is a thing that exists. The goal is to stop using and... St well, you can if you go Amprim. So, I mean, it's possible, but yeah. Stop relying on capitalist supply lines. Highly bureaucratic, highly centralized capitalist... I, I just want I just want to hear what the anarchist supply line is going to look like. I, I, there's so many memes of like... I wonder if I can find this the image I'm talking about. There you go. Here it is. How would glasses distribution work under anarchism? Would there be roving optometrists or would there hopefully be one per commune? Anarchismus with the triangular hat says, I need glasses. Hey, I like making glasses and helping people who need them. Take these. Thanks. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Anarchist economic policy, baby. <laughs> supply lines, which deliver to paying consumers, not people who need it. Those capitalist supply lines, those consumer supply lines deliver to consumers. Not to those in need. So, if I seem a little frustrated about this particular topic, it's because I've had a thousand people, no joke, literally, like a thousand people tweeting the most, like, bird-brained, uh, bad straw man of a single tweet I made because fucking Destiny retweeted it to his audience and then Vosh jumped on it. Damn. You know what would have been really cool? If you would have gotten an opportunity to clarify everything in front of at this point hundreds of thousands of people with somebody who's just asking you basic questions about what you believe and the language of your tweets i think that would have gone i think that would have gone a long way in helping people be more charitable towards the demon mama i think that would have been really helpful to you that's what i think i think i think people should give demon mama more opportunities like that where they just they just ask her questions and give her the opportunity to clarify in front of a lot of people as well so more people know what she actually believes i think that's that's helpful but Fortunately, she didn't get that opportunity, so, you know, she's, she's stuck in the, in the rut that she's in right now. Which I don't appreciate, for the record. The point is, okay, let me offer you, and here's another direction that I'm going to go with this, okay? There is a difference, and, so, and somebody by the name of CounterPoints, I'm going to give a little tiny, little tiny bit of, uh, um, I'm going to give a little tiny bit of, 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 uh, of credence to CounterPoints here, okay? CounterPoints made a tweet, and he said, that the, the problem with, he watched the conversation, and he said, and I'm quoting approximately. The problem here is that Demon Mama is talking about anarchist solutions in the here and now, and Vosh wants to talk about a 1,000-year anarchist project. And that is true. I am not, I don't believe in a thing like a 1,000-year anarchist project. I don't think that we can even conceive of that, because I think that all that we can really do is think of worlds that we want, that we want to aim for, and work on them in the here and now. Sounds pretty different from, from our previous conversations about schooling, where the thing is just like, let's find out something bad. And then we'll just kind of do things and see what, what works. I don't need to have every and out of my new system in order to be able to advocate for something new. Um, but yeah, but the issue is that, sure, she's saying that she's saying things for here and now. But her prescriptions for here and now fucking dog shit. So is her analysis thing, right? That, that's, the, that's the issue here. I can, wait, 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 but that's the thing. Hanubia, to be fair, I can see how someone could have gotten tripped up on my tweets. I can too, but I was not allowed to explain the trip up. See, this is what this is this is this is the narrative I said from the very beginning. This is what she's gonna try to spin. And remember that chatter who pointed out I was like, hey, you weren't like interrogated on this. Like there was this entire process occurred and you came on voluntarily after Vosh asked if you want to have the opportunity to clarify or whatever. And and Dimamba just said, Wow, thank you, in a very sarcastic tone. This is the this is the narrative that she's gonna try to sell. She was given the, the best opportunity. Oh my god, if I ever 
have like a, a Twitter moment and everybody's clowning on me, if I get the opportunity to go on a big streamer, especially somebody that treated me with kid gloves as much as Bosch did in that conversation to clarify my thing, oh my God, I would be clear. I would be the most, the most innocent, uncancelable person in that moment, assuming that I actually had a, a reason, you know, that I actually was misrepresented and it wasn't just that I was, you know, represented accurately, but couldn't defend myself. Um, but yeah, she was given that the, the best opportunity uh, to clarify this and she just, she kind of threw it away. Um, but yeah. <sighs> counterpoints, not contrapoints. I know the name, counterpoints. He's a smaller content creator. Counterpoints, he, him. So, the, uh, then, uh, anyway, let's talk about something, okay? Good faith actresses. There seems to be a trend of you arguing against how a thing is distributed or administered and people interpreting as you arguing against the thing itself. Curious. I know. Yeah, here's the tweet. Let me show you the tweet right here. But the okay? thing is, the way you're arguing for things to be distributed is terrible and it makes no sense. And the analysis is dark shit and it's ANCAP logic. Like, I this is a great tweet. I want to quote counterpoints directly. <laughs> and I will point out, I have had a fantastic conversation with counterpoints specifically about anarchism, okay? Demon Mama is an anarchist and believes in the power of parallel structures. I don't think Vosh is an anarchist unless it's on a millennia law along project and ideal. That is the disconnect in this conversation. Now, I don't know that I would agree with his wording exactly, but I agree, agree with his sentiment. Vosh and I had very, very different approaches, and the difference was Vosh didn't seem willing to consider that what I, the person who wrote the tweet, was talking about could have been differently than what he, having read all of DGG's shitty-ass uh, straw man about it, was talking about. And Damn, it would have been a good thing if he gave you the perfect opportunity to clarify in front of fucking thousands of people while asking you very simple softball questions. That would have been good. Uh, okay. I'm just gonna- I'm just gonna point it out again. I'm not gonna do a thing every time because it's just- uh. ...that he's the one asking the questions, I feel like maybe he should have offered me a little bit better faith? Come on. So. I- I can't- I'm losing my mind. And here's the thing about the MMO, okay? Um... This is what I've learned. That if she, uh, like, obtains any degree of pushback at all, even from softball Vosh, even from me in the previous debates that me and Dean Mama had. Um, she will say that she's that, that that other person is uncharitably trying to frame you and not give me the opportunity to support your beliefs. And if the conversation is anything but you asking a very non-confrontational question and then giving her the 10 to 45 minutes necessary to answer that basic questions, uh, you're trying to bad faith pigeonhole her into something she doesn't believe. And this was obvious in the Vosh debate, you know, as we know, uh, but also in my last debate with your mama. Um, there you can see that in the first hour, which was basically me just interviewing her, me asking her like a, a fairly like softball question and being like, hey, can you explain this just to make sure I have your take correctly? So I'm not arguing against something you don't believe in. And that kind of went on for like an hour. And she was like, this is a really good conversation. I really like this. And then when I stepped in, I was like, okay, hold on. I need to, I need to push on some of these things. I need to get the word in. I need to like speak for more than 30% of the time here. Uh, then, then she was like, oh, this has just evolved into bad faith debate larva antics where you're just trying to debate bro your way, you know, into framing me as somebody who hates school kids or whatever the fuck. Um, and then that happened for a while. And then in the end, when I went back to just like answering her open-ended questions and just like here, watching her ramble, then she was like, you know what? I think that's the conversation picked up a lot now in the end. I think now it's a, it's a good charitable open discussion where we're working towards productive outcomes for the things that we're talking about. Like it's... If you do, if you do any amount of pushback at all for Demon Mama, it's you being an uncharitable person trying to pigeonhole her. The only thing she will accept is just letting her ramble. And and when she when you let her ramble, it's not that it's like, it's just like okay, now you're not doing this negative thing. It's like at that point when basically she's the only one allowed to speak and present ideas. That's when she's like, you know what? I think this is a really productive conversation. We're really working through our ideas in a meaningful capacity. Um, spoilers: It's only her that. Meaningful is a bit generous, but is, is working through her ideas live, you know, uninterrupted in a monologue, basically a lecture. But yeah, that's just, that's just something to keep in mind with the mom. okay? This is how she will frame discussions. But yeah. That was a bit of a distraction. Let's get back to the main point, okay? Let me ask you something. Agreed. What happens? What happens right now? Let's just, I want you just to do a thought experiment with me, okay? We're going to just sit here. Okay, you, right now, statistically, probably take some medications. I want you to close your eyes. Wrong. I'm lucky. Eyes. And imagine a world. In which I take uh, vitamin C pills for my medication. I mean, under the anarchist system, I'll just I'll just get get a few of my my chemist friends to hold up the bottle up to the sun, and then the the vitamin D I think it's vitamin D goes in there and formalizes and crystallizes into pills. But yeah, I'm sorry. 
uh, let's say a world not far from here. Let's imagine you actually live in Ukraine. And one day, Russians invade and they destroy the supply lines to the stores going into your town, okay? How do you get the medication that you take every day now? You go to the pharmacy? Well, the pharmacy so my question is, how does Demon Mama system solve for this? Because she's also, she's, she said that she's not against supply lines. She said that she believes in the production process. She believes in transport and stuff like that. She doesn't believe in everybody just making everything that they have on the spot. So if you have this, the anarchist, you know, free non-profit supply line, wouldn't that just be equally disrupted by a war? I, I don't understand. This is a, this is a critique that's, that's unique to, to current supply lines, but that, that solves her own one or that doesn't impact her own one. I, yeah. Pharmacy's gone or closed or out of stock. So now what? You have medicine you need. Where do you get it? You ask your friends? You ask your found family? Well, it turns out in our modern world, if something bad happens, you usually just die. Yeah. As opposed to previously in history, where, uh, where something bad happened, you lived. That's, that's how previous histories worked. That's right. Here in America, you don't have money, you don't have a home, you're, you, you just die. And in a country where something like a disaster happens, like an invasion or, you know, a series of natural disasters like wildfires that wipe out your town, uh, wow, we don't, we don't actually know where to get any of our medicine outside of the pharmacies near us. Now, if you're- Yeah, no, Shay, if there's like a, a catastrophic, societally destructive event, such as a war or like a massive natural disaster that, as she says, burns down your entire uh, turn, town, yeah, it's going to be a bit difficult to get through things. I don't know what, what what else can like can solve for this unless we teach everybody how to be like a go out and be a forest gremlin and like take the important leaves like they can and then put in like a little mortar and then like sip on them and make them into a salad that you rub all over your nose and your eye. like I yeah I'm I'm just I'm I'm confused as to how this critique doesn't apply to her own system for the first thing uh, and then furthermore also once again very U.S. centric perspective here when she's saying about what is possible under the modern world so my understanding hey. Scandinavia and large parts of Europe, they're also part of the modern world. And they're, you know, just because you don't have money doesn't necessarily mean you're just like, okay, you know, you're fucked in the same capacity that you are in the US. There are better social safety nets that can exist in our modern world, where what she's describing here, where somebody just runs out of money in a society, sounds environmental disaster, war, invasion, bomb, whatever, um, where they don't die. But yeah. You're lucky you might have access to a credit card and the internet, and then you might be able to order your medicine online. But guess what? There's a problem with that. Because if you're in the area that's affected by a natural disaster, war, or anything else like that, how the fuck are you going to get a delivery? So do you just die? So, yeah, I, I guess she wants us all to this legitimately be... Yeah, this, like everybody everybody makes their own medicine at home. Like every community makes... I, I assume that's going to be it. But then how is this going to... But then obviously that's very difficult to do because as we all know from any forms of logistical thinking here... Um, is that if you need to produce something and you spread it out over a large area and small different cells, the production is going to be horridly inefficient. And we already have large portions of shortages of certain important things um, occurring right now, right? Uh, when it comes to certain medications or certain treatments or where the supply is low, so thus that, you know, the dem demand for is very high and the prices are pretty high. Now there's obviously some, like, you know, fuckering, fucker, fucking, there's some fuckery. Like, there we go. That goes on there that, you know, makes it obviously not just supply and demand. But we have these things going on right now where things are expensive and hard to produce. And yet we're expecting like a society in which every like small local community has its own like drug production facilities in which they're able to make the quantity, the quality, and, you know, especially, you know, experimental things, which is kind of what we're talking about here. That's just easy to access there for the population. I don't know how this would work. It's, it like... It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, which is the advantage of like a modern society so much is that, hey, I can ingest, I can take drugs that were manufactured like, like thousands of thousands of kilometers away because they're shipped here and I can take advantage of them anyway because of that, like the degree of transportation that exists. And because of that, those drugs are going to be safer. They're going to be better regulated. They're going to be cheaper to obtain. They're going to be like all these things uh, just because of, of the way our production process works right now in the 21st century. Um... So yeah, number one, I don't know how this would insulate her system. Number two, um, what I assume would be the only way to work around this, which is every local community having their thing. And once again, that not being damaged by whatever disaster we're talking about is going to have sufficient, you know, amounts of medicines or whatever to be able to last throughout a crisis where you can't obtain the important things. That you, yeah, I, this is just a, 
I, I don't know how, I don't know how, any way how our system gets around this. Now, when I think about that, you might go, damn, Demon Mama, isn't that a bit apocalyptic? Do you know when we live? Do you know what's, do you, have you forgotten that we've lived in a pandemic for two years in which, uh, how many people are dead in America now because of lack of, because of, because of our lack of response to this disaster? How many? So Over once again, notice how previous arguments was like, okay, um, this is the issues with, with capitalist medicine as it works right now. And, and then she shifted it to response. I think she said government response. Uh, how say? many people are dead in America now because of lack of, because of, because of our lack of response to this disaster? Lack of response. Lack of response includes way more than what she was talking about previously with just supply lines. Lack of response is talking about things like lockdowns. It's talking about things like mass. It's talking about things like cultural attitudes and population likelihood to follow recommendations. It's talking about things like government legislation and policy put in place in order to protect people. It's talking about like about 9 million different things that have a lot to do, you know, the, the, the demographics of your population, you know, your risk groups and stuff like that. It has to do with so much more than what she's talking about here with just supply lines. But then she's, she changes, you know, and says just, oh, look at the response. And acts as if that response is just entirely something that is dependent on the supply lines. When in reality, there's like 9 million other things going on there as well. that are pretty significant. But yeah. Stir? How many? Over a million? I haven't even checked recently. Let's take a look. 900,000 something. Let's take a look. Can we see? Let's take a look. United States. Fatal cases. 971,000 Americans have died amidst the super advanced medical state of the United States. So once again... Uh, very American-centric perspective. Number two, um, medical systems can be advanced in different extents. The research and development aspect of U.S. medicine is very advanced. However, the consumer and access and accessibility, I guess access and accessibility are the same thing, but the, the, the consumer access to those things, that's not very advanced. And that's where the problem lies. So once again, very one-dimensional thinking here. There are different aspects to a medical system. There are different ac like aspects to the production of medicine and the distribution of it and all of those things. Um, but what she's saying here is like, oh, this is advanced, but it's not working. Instead of looking a bit more special and be like, okay, what's not working? And how do we fix that? And how can we learn from other countries to do that thing better? You know? Um, so yeah. What if that's you next time? What if that's you next year? What if that's you in six months? You know that right now in Ukraine and Russia, both countries, which uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, all of the citizens could have been peacefully enjoying their social media and playing video games, that in Russia, they are now d d absolutely dunked into a complete uh, economic destruction, that the average person can't get any money and is struggling with food. She does the Trump hand movements a lot. Like, she does the, the, the hand and the <laughs> things. I don't know. Food in Russia. Then in Ukraine, if you're in one of the war-torn areas, you have nothing. And the reason for that is because... Yeah, I don't know what the, the point of this is. Wars make it difficult for you to live. Wow. Mind-blowing political analysis. We have been made reliant on exclusive systems. We sit here every day looking at other countries having mass casualty events. We sit here every single day looking at our own country having a medical mass casualty event. And then we go, yeah, we don't need to address this at all. We don't need to have alternatives. We don't need to make uh, uh, med medicinal knowledge available to as many people as possible. People who literally aren't allowed to get to get training, who literally can't afford to go to medical school, who literally can't afford to pay their rent. We need to. So now she's touching on on like five, six different things that we have a lot of good solutions for. We have a lot of different things, especially in relative to where the U.S. is right now, that improves access to education. We have a lot of things that improve access to housing. We have a lot of things that we know that we can put in place that do work that don't require an entire like overhaul and the creation of the nonprofit anarchist supply lines or whatever, which yeah, once again, no idea how those would work. Um, but yeah, so she, she rounds off a lot of things like we don't have any solutions to them, but they exist. We know how to solve for these things. And it's very important. Also the implication here that like the average person needs like a, a sufficient amount of, you know, understanding and knowledge about medication and chemistry and you know pharmacological production in order to be able to like circumvent these th things that we're talking about is just I, I don't think that's possible um yeah for everybody to be educated to that extent especially with something as complex as like medicine production and healthcare and uh and and like physiology and stuff like that so yeah to equip as many people with as much knowledge as possible. We need to find the people out there who can't afford to go to the school, who actually turns out they're gifted, gifted fucking chemists. Do you know how many people are geniuses but don't ever get to go to college? Don't ever get to learn anything? A lot. Yeah. A lot. There would be more kids like that under her system. More potential gifted chemists and geniuses that rather than go to school, 
because it's not mandatory, they stay at home playing League of Legends. We have lost countless of Albert Einsteins to the Rift. This is a serious problem, and Demon Mama is just making it worse. A lot. The majority of geniuses that have ever lived will never get to live up to their full potential because it's locked behind literally the dice, the dumb, the worst gamble of money ever. Money is concentrated in the hands of a handful of capitalists worldwide. Everyone else, that includes you, unless you happen to be Jeff Bezos, is going to get fucked. And Just for clarification, I'm not Jeff Bezos. Guess what? Right now, capitalism is not having a good time. Climate change is crawling up on us, and we rely on highly, on not just highly, 100% profit motive systems in order to be okay. And here's the real thing I want you all to think about. When shit goes bad in capitalism, um, but the, goes, the thing that she's talking about isn't just profit motive stuff. Part of it is, but part of it is also just this is just how logistics and supply chains works, and this is how they're affected by massive global or national catastrophes. It's bad in capitalism. Um, do you know what happens first? No one is denied directly, usually. What happens first is the price goes up, and then you can't afford it. That's what happens. And if you think you're free of that, well, you're not. Because, see, there's always somebody richer than you in capitalism. So as long as they can afford it, and as long as uh, they're willing to pay for it, you're just fucked. So let's say there's a life-saving medicine. Demon Mama discovers scarcity. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I... And you, a poor person, um, you know, you, a poor person, need that medicine. But the price goes up by $100 a month. You can't afford it. But the guy next door to you, the guy across town from you, who makes twice your income, can easily afford it. They're still fine. It can go up $1,000. Uh, or it can go up uh, $1,200 per year. And they can afford it. But you can't. You just disappear. You just stop getting your medicine. Do you understand what I'm saying? This was not your original tweet. As it turns out, True. I don't know if you caught this, but tweets only have fucking 200 characters in them. So uh, wouldn't it have been a good thing when you got the opportunity to talk uninterrupted? I can't do this. Okay. okay. This narrative of like, she wasn't given enough time to clarify. It's just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gayfesh. Appreciate that. I even made, I even out of good faith, out of a, out of a, a, a tongue in cheek good faith, I literally made a thread about it. What the fuck is a tongue in cheek good faith? Does anyone know what a, what a, what a tongue in cheek good faith is? But this is the problem. You see, this is the problem with the way that everyone engages on this, but also the way that Vosh engaged on this, and part of the thing that made me frustrated. Here we go. Yes, Chronic Cine, I really want to talk with more disabled activists and speak on disabled issues. It's one of the areas I feel the worst about not giving coverage on. It's something that's very important to me. I think about it a lot. I've talked about it a lot, but I haven't had a whole lot of people on. Problem is, the truth is, I struggle with collaborations because they take a lot of communicative effort. They take a lot of scheduling effort, and it tires me out. I've seen people cry because their insurance wouldn't cover their necessary top shelf meds. It makes me furious. People did not ask to have these ailments. I agree. And we must acknowledge that the current system locks many people out, and that we are not done changing things. And that, in fact so many people that we are literally chained to a system that doesn't have to function this way. You realize that we choose to make supply lines function the way they do. We choose to build consumer supply lines where you buy things from people who buy things from people who buy things instead of saying, wait a minute, we have a need, our population. Imagine an alternate world, guys. Imagine an alternate. So saying, saying we choose to do this, once again, it's a common theme there. It's very one dimensional. It's not like we just have like, like there exists just like the societal choice of like, okay, do we do based anarchist nonprofit supply lines or do we do capitalist mode of production supply lines? What do we do? Hmm. Let's choose to do the capitalist ones. It's obviously not that simple. And here's where we go to the issue that we keep bringing back to over and over is that she has failed to substantiate how the basic ins and outs of her system and how it would operate. The closest thing we get is like the, the reputation system we talked about, which once again, most of her arguments that she makes against capitalist system would apply to her own system. But also number two, the 19, the like the, the four or five different things I listed for why that type of reputation analysis towards keeping producers in check is like a silly way to do things. So yeah, I'm, we, we still keep, we, we keep bumping into this wall over and over where there are reasons why things exist as they do today. Um, but I don't think the MoMA properly understands them. Uh, but yeah world where somebody says i have an ailment is there a medicine that we can that can solve it and you go yes this pharmacy produces a medicine that can solve it here's the necessary science that proves this and then that person's doctor can go i need that medicine and then that medicine gets delivered to that doctor to that person and we have a supply chain built for that purpose not for the purpose of making money it's literally the anarchist economic policy meme but it's literally just like <laughs> you need medicine okay well we'll just get them to send you the medicine and give it to you this is how economics works this is how transactions work like i if Dimama thinks this is so fucking simple, she would be the best public policy advisor in the history of humankind.
ever. But I guess if if you know having basic communications with like a you know like a public figure of some sense to talk about ableism is like too much engagement, then I suppose being a you know too difficult to organize and being a public policy manager maybe isn't for her. But um, but if it's as simple as she's talking about, then please give the world your model. Write text on this. Explain how this works. Explain how that system exists. Like verbalize it, conceptualize it, model it. But no, it's just like just we just we just do it, and now everybody gets what they want. Like money, not for the purpose of preserving patents, not for the purpose of uh, of of upholding the economy, but rather to deliver the medicine to the people in need, to deliver and produce it to the people in need. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I've been talking about. Wasn't the NHS built upon that ideal? Yes! Many, <laughs> many universal systems go for that approach. Now, there are problems still with universal health care, but they do start to alleviate this, and you want to know what they do? Guys, here's the hot take. Ready? Okay, Ready for I'm, the... Okay, I'm... I'm, where, I'm... Okay, hold on, guys. <laughs> now we're about to get the hot take, okay? I'm holding Hottest on. Hottest hot take of all? You okay. ready? Are you fucking ready? I'm ready. Here we... Here, here, here we go. I'm ready. Building an NHS would equal blowing up every capitalist supply line in America. Oh! <gasps> <gasps> oh no! Remember when Doe made that joke about blowing up supply lines? As it turns out, Doe was joking about the fact that any change that you make for the betterment of people would, by definition, destroy consumerist supply lines. They would, and they did. Other countries that have national health care systems were willing to destroy the existing very bad supply lines and build new ones. Okay, f I don't know what I. F okay, okay. Let's let's go through this procedurally. Okay, number one, there is semi kind of conflict here that occurs between what you said before of like supply chains are are, are absolutely necessary to get things working to now. Oh, we can just absolutely destroy supply lines. In fact, that's something that has been done in a lot of countries that have public healthcare systems. It's point number one. But point number two, that's more important. When you shift over from like a more, more, more privatized um, system that's uh, that you might have in the U.S., for example, to like a more public one, you're not just you're not destroying all the supply lines. You're not just getting rid of it entirely. You're not demolishing all the factories. You're not, you know. Um, you know, changing a lot of like the logistical plans to function. For the most part, it's often just like changing of ownership structures, changing of management structures, changing of uh, of, of like of, of revenue systems and where they are obtained um, and stuff like that. It's more like you're, and uh, Nickers are allergic to this word, but it's more like you're reforming the supply chains that already exist and you modify them in ways to bring the interests more in line with the, in this case, the populist then, right? When it comes to public health care and stuff like that. Um, so you're not you're not nuking supply you're not getting rid of supply lines you're just tweaking them you're just changing how the distribution occurs you're changing how that what, what it looks like at the point of purchase you're changing the way that it's functioned you're changing the way that it's ran you're changing the way that it's regulated but you're not just you're not blowing everything up nationalization doesn't mean you're destroying everything as it existed once again we got more of like an ANCAP vibe going on here nationalization just means that you change it you tweak it you reform it but yeah I. You're ignoring the worst part of her argument. She wants us to be like the best. True. Lamau, jazz dog. That's fucking hilarious. But it's funny because she wants the aesthetic of like, hey, we're, we're destroying, we're nuking supply lines. But then she also says that you can't get rid of supply lines and that she's then, you know, fine with supply lines. But then she also chooses to advocate for the peripheral systems instead of focusing on the... Yeah, I, I, there's like six things here. Infernatrix Sophia says, it was mo motivated reasoning the entire time. There was a pretty clear push to misunderstand you. He was actively searching for a specific interpretation of straw man and everything became a retrofit. I do tend to agree with that interpretation. I, I do. Uh, sorry, but I think that's accurate. I think Vosh was very mad. Hanubia, uh, if you join my Discord server, we can chat after this conversation. I don't know why he was mad. I expressed confusion at why he was mad. I expressed confusion as to why he was calling me a gaslighter, and I expressed confusion as to why he was calling me an abuser, and then his response to that was, stop playing the victim. You, uh, you're, you're better than this. Which I think is a, is an asshole, uh, bad faith thing to do, personally. Damn. They lecture by demon mama. I'm being but bad I'm not faith. J.K. Rowling, Sober Flote. I'm not, I didn't even criticize him on J.K. Rowling. In fact, we're gonna talk about that later. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that later. 
I'm not so sure about that. There's any number of reasons why someone could get hung up over trivial details. Perhaps I'm being too charitable. Well, see, that's the thing. There was, uh, there was no charitability given to me, and the power, and the, and the. Yeah, this is what I mean. Unless you're just you're just sitting back and asking a basic, super soft question and this little ramble for like half an hour, you're not you're not even giving her the modicum of charitability. That's just how it works for her. I. I don't know. She she expects to be treated as like the, the like the princess of Twitch politics, you know, um, the monarch of Twitch politics, you know, whatever you prefer to use, um, where people just give her uninterrupted time for rambling, and that's basic charitability. But if you do what Vosh, that's like yeah, I don't, I don't know. Sorry. The the power of the show was in Vosh's hands. Vosh chose to look at my tweet that was getting dogpiled on. Vosh chose to not look at my other stream, and then Vosh chose to interrogate me as if I have a history of being a bad faith actor when I don't. In <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, ignore that last part. So once again, the previous don't know, like explain how this worked. There's a lot of discourse about this tweet. Obviously, Vosh is a streamer. He's going to cover, he's going to read down the stream. He's going to talk about the controversy. Um, chatters ask, hey, you know, can we have Dimama to talk about this? Uh, Vosh is like, hey, Dimama, do you want to have the chance to clarify this on stream? Dimama says yes and accepts and comes on the stream. And Vosh asks really softball questions until even Vosh gets fed up and is like, holy shit, you're not answering anything. And then, you know, things devolve into more back and forth. In fact, Vosh has a video out on his channel talking about how I'm the most willing person to die on a hill. Did he ever stop for one second and think maybe the argument was being, you know, misinterpreted pretty badly? Nah, come on. Her being willing to die on a hill doesn't help her case. Um, I don't know why she thinks that it helps her case here. But, but yeah. It could mean that, like, hey, you 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 put something out and then you refuse to walk it back, even though it's pretty fucking silly, right? That's also that's what it means to die on a hill, right? I missed it probably, but are y'all still friends? I don't know. I don't fucking know. Just talk to me. On his stream, he said a bunch of stupid shit about me. Uh, in another stream, he was streaming about other shit, and I happened to be watching, and uh, he was saying shit like, "Oh, I should have seen this coming. I, I guess I let a lot of stuff slip with Demon Mama." And I'm like, Dude, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Based, Vosh. What do you mean? You should have you known after I debated Demon Mama. You should have known that this was coming. Slip. Like, I don't know. Whatever, man. So, like, that's on him. If, 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 I mean, he's been joking about burning a bridge with me since the conversation happened. So, if he, if, if to him, like, if to him, my tweet was so egregious that he wants to joke about burning a bridge, that's on him. That's, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to... Spoiler alert, it's probably not the tweet that's making Vosh want to do this. It's probably the way that conversation went. I mean, there's, there's a, just an intuition. I'm not sure. This is what I think. somebody's own personal problems in that way. I just, it doesn't, it, it's fucking stupid to me. That's not the way I do things. And I'm not going to sit there and like, I'm not going to sit there and like, go, go super nice and be like, no, please don't burn the bridge. When somebody fucking went out of their way to call me a gaslighter and an abuser multiple times over a conversation, over a disagreement about uh, supply lines. Guys, that's unhinged and unhealthy. That is a like extremely, extremely weird way of engaging with other people that I don't want to engage with. So if he. Yes, because as we know, Dimam is very principled in refusing to engage in any types of name calling. Or any character attacks or anything of the sort when she debates people. Um, ignore the debate I had with you. Not, not the <laughs> the uh, d debate larva uh, incidents, which we, we shall not talk about. The use your spine incidents, which we shall not talk about. The uncharitable bad faith debate bro incidents, which we shall not talk about. Just, just, just aside from that, you know? He really wants to? Well, uh, then maybe he can watch that back and reflect on his actions. I don't care. Like, I'm I'm frustrated that, that, that he said the things he did about me, not about my point. I don't care if he's a liberal and doesn't think that anarchism can happen unless you time skip 1,000 years in the future. I don't really care if he feels that way or not. I don't care if he is or isn't. I personally don't really call him a lib all the time. I think that, you know, sometimes he's a little more willing to engage with anarchist thought, other times he's not. I don't really care about any of that. But what I do care about is the fact that somebody who I consider a colleague, who I have a history of good engagement with, decided to take an opportunity where we could talk about a political issue with some contention and turn it into a thing about whether or not I'm a gaslighter or an abuser because he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. So once again, talking with an issue with a bit of contention, it means just letting the mama ramble into oblivion, okay? Never forget that. I love how it's like the progression. It's like, it's gone from like, from like, we had Destiny, and then we had Vosh, and Vosh was like, okay, no, Destiny's a lib. I'm a, I'm a base anarchist. I, I'm, I'm more left-leaning. And then we have the mama <laughs> saying the same thing to Destiny. There's probably some some fourth iteration there. Some, doing that to Vosh, I mean. So there's probably some fourth iteration. Just keeps going. The the lib vortex just keeps getting larger. Sorry, that's not my problem, guys. Uh, and I don't really care how many DGGers or Voshites or whatever are like, oh, oh, you should be, oh, make apologies, dude, just save the bridge. I don't care. You guys are totally not healthily connected, and you don't understand what the fuck is going on. Like, from my perspective, uh, somebody who I respect and a colleague just freaked out and performatively called me an abuser and, and gaslighter to their friends because they were so mad, uh, to their to their friends and, and audience because they were so mad about an out-of-context tweet. Once again, 
recommend you check out the video that Zoe edited um, about the ways in which Demon Mom answers question and how frustrating that is to try to understand Bosch's behavior more. Tal 90 says, Bosch misheard you when he called you a gaslighter and acknowledged it when chat point pointed out after the bait. Yeah, a little late. Maybe he should issue a bit of a, maybe he should say something. Maybe he should apologize for that because he went really fucking hard on that point and he didn't have to. He could have just not been an asshole, but he was. I mean, he literally acknowledged it after the stream. He did say something about it. I... I, I maybe she's saying that he, he should say something privately, which I don't know if, if that occurred, but I mean, he did acknowledge it. So, I mean, I guess that's not enough. So whatever. And this isn't the first time. I still remember King Get Pride. I still think... Uh, I still remember that this is the fucking way it goes. I, I am treated with zero charitability in this space. And that's not me fucking, I'm not the only one said this. Fucking Xander Hall fucking said this. Xander okay, Hall. well in that case, in that case, <laughs> undisputable evidence, okay? Not only Demon Mama, the person in question, but also Xander Hall thinks that she's always treated in bad faith. I, case closed. Guys, it's done. It's over. Out that every single person who fucking engages with me in this space straight up gives me zero charitability. And most of that is because of, of a particular creator who spent a year spreading explicit lies about me to every single person in this space. So everyone comes at me as if I'm the villain of the day. Once again, when I had my conversation with her, I gave her like one hour to clarify and just answer basic softball questions. And then she called me spy on us and then we went a bit more back and forth. Ryoma, I'm telling you, I told you I want to make stream history, and I don't make stream history by, by, I'm not going to make stream She is making stream history. Streaming history, I'm not going to make the art that I want to make by playing, like, stupid games because people can't keep their anger in check. When I'm wrong, I fucking apologize for it. And I have, publicly. You all can go look at the fucking record. Also, I have publicly published multiple experiences of me undergoing completely unnecessary criticism just because I was hoping that my opponents would give me a chance to hear my position out. So with all due respect, uh, the record speaks for itself. I don't know anything about this record, so I can neither confirm nor deny. So whatever. Are we, we're coming. Are we? Are we coming to an end? There's a bit more on the. On Even this. outside of everything else, that was one of the worst showings for Vosh when it came to engaging with the point. I literally didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah Vosh was the one who wouldn't engage with the points or with the questions in that debate. Beautiful analysis. Oh my god, I love. I love this, 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 this is an interesting social experiment. Like this, this chat room on screen right now, it's, it's quite something. If I sounded, if in that conversation I sounded bewildered and confused, it's because I was. I do not know why anyone was as mad at me as they were outside of the, the DGG hates my guts. And so the entirety of the DGG net was jumping on that tweet because they already hate my guts. And now BGG does as well. And everyone, it's a conspiracy. Everybody hates him in my mind. Oh. Vosh forgets that when Lil Red says he forgets he's talking to a fellow friend and not a lib. He wasn't even willing to hear you out. Uh, he not a lib. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking, the, just the, the transformation of the word like lib is like the perpetual boogeyman. It's just funny. Hate that people want you to, to save a bridge that he burned over nothing. Well, Vosh, technically Vosh would have been a lib, but whatever. Like, Vosh is the anyway. lib. Anyway, the sure. debate with Vosh was super hard to listen to. How do you think I felt? Like, no offense, but like, I, I, by the way, another thing I'll note, this is something that really annoyed me. I, I'm just sorry, just listen up for a second. This is something that personally annoyed me, and some of you in this chat may be guilty of this. So, uh, let me just say, uh, the people who said that I was being, um, like a piece of shit and really rude, I implore you to go back and watch again. I don't think there was a single point in that entire conversation where I made any accusations about Vosh's personality. I don't think there was any point in which I insulted him or his platform. I think the only thing I said was, and I'm gonna cop to this, at the very, very end of the conversation, I said, I feel like you're schizo posting at me because I felt like he was making up things completely unrelated to what I said and saying them to me. And Let's have an independent fact check. Let's run through this claim. Uh, we're checking. The analyst desk has uh, has, has come up with, uh, with a finding here. So at timestamp 3 hours, 33 minutes, and 30 seconds in, before the schizo comment, uh, Demon Mama says to Vosh, and I quote, you're just being a fucking cunt. This has been the independent fact check. We will not continue with the video. And perhaps that was a misspeak, but I will point out that it happened at the very end, after I'd already been accused of being a gaslighter, and after I'd already been accused of being an abuser. So I think that when people go and watch that, and they say I was being a piece of shit, that you're literally Fox Newsing yourself. If you go back and watch that, I would like to see. I asked openly on my server for people to give me clips of me insulting Vosh, or of me making aspersions about his, person about his personality. Didn't do it. No clips. Didn't see fucking any of it. Three hours, 30 minutes. 33 minutes? I think it was 33 minutes, right? 3 hours, 33 minutes, and 30 seconds in. We got that one. And that happened before this gets a comment, so that wasn't at the end of the discussion. But yeah, I'm just, just independently factoring that one. Yeah, and he called me literally Hassan, so what the fuck? That's the worst He said insult. that like three times. I 
I do agree with everything you're saying here, but that debate was emblematic of my problem with generally debates in general. It's the reason why I switch off whenever debate happens. I enjoy your content a lot. Uh, that, and that's 90% of your content. It's hard to put into words what the problem was. The debates are impossible for me to have because the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the only debates that I can have that are any fun is debates against conservatives. And the reason for that is because uh, conservatives, we can just dunk on freely. And you don't have to pretend that there's good faith because the reality is that most online debates cannot be in good faith and never will be, even between friends and colleagues. And they almost never go anywhere. It's just true. And part of that is the fault of the debate bros. Part of that is the fault of the people who supposedly like to- Keep in mind, I'm the biggest one. I'm the, I'm the biggest bad faith debate bro of them all. To do debate, but don't actually have master over, mastery over their craft outside of making a personal brand. If that's your only goal, great. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sure it was somewhat ableist, but also, uh, like, I think I was matching the tone pretty well. <laughs> it's not just, it's just so funny, because sometimes I, like, I just, like, zone out for my second. My brain forgets about, about just, like, politics. And within the politics community, that sounds like nothing in particular. But just imagine just, like, a random person. You just have a random person, and you just present them with the quote, yeah, that was a bit ableist, but I think I was matching the tone. <laughs> I think I was matching the energy. It's just, like... It's just a funny fucking sentence. Yeah, I don't know. Everything is fucking censored now. I don't get it. Brainstream says, being disabled is super weird because you both hate the current system and are terrified when it changes that you will fall further through the cracks. And it doesn't help how quick anti-pharma becomes pro-eugenics on the left, which I think fueled a lot of the overreaction backlash. Yes, but... Again, that's not my problem. That's other people reading into my argument. I was specifically, very specifically... um specifically addressing people who I, I am trying to make sure people don't fall through the current or future cracks. Literally, that's the conversation I was trying to have. It's pretty much it, right? There's a little bit more. Fun, but Vosh asked you at some point if you would sue your dealer as a joke and a little time later admitted what a stupid point that was. Oh yeah, also, sorry not to keep ranting, but that is why you watch me. Um, Not to keep ranting, but he also said that I was making ANCAP arguments, which is so motherfucking stupid. That okay. made me so angry. <laughs> Losing my mind. What the fuck? I, can't do I was this. literally making the opposite. It was such a stupid, a stupid do allegation. I'm losing ANCAPs my mind. don't care. They believe that the, the supply chain should be as privatized as possible. I'm losing I was my not mind. making ANCAP arguments. I was specifically saying the opposite. Let's make explicitly non-profit reputation-based systems that check one another for the good of the of the stated goal. Let's find <laughs> out ways to. I can't fucking do it. I can't do it. I can't. It's just. <laughs> I'm not making ANCAP argument, proceeds to make ANCAP argument. Uh, uh, Who fund uh, those things in the modern time that uh, doesn't involve building a profit incentive? It was so stupid. Like, the idea that that's an ANCAP argument is just genuinely, that was one of the stupidest things said in that entire conversation, and no one gave a shit. Because, again, the charitability was out the window from the get-go. Which is, personally, quite ob obnoxious to me. Quite fucking obnoxious. Also, they immediately jumped to the ANPRIM thing. And I'm specifically not an ANPRIM. I am literally make arguments against anarcho-primitivism. Okay, it's good. so stupid. But again, somewhere. there was She's no attempt glasses, good to faith fair, so at all. So fucking annoying. Are you an Amprim? No. Do you believe in what Amprims believe? No, I don't. Can you demonstrate that you don't believe in what Amprims believe? Yes, I do not. I'm not anti-technology. I'm not anti-invention. I'm not anti-science. I don't believe that we should return to being hunter-gatherers. I just think that things that we do right now are not good, and there are ways that we can do them better, and there are things that we already discovered in the past that aren't being used right now because they're not profitable that we could use. So annoying. So fucking annoying. Okay, the yeah, but have you thought about this? Thing. Monkey. True. I think what Vosh was saying, they're not necessarily that she has the ideology of an ANCAP, but that her system has similar outcomes. Okay, everybody. Bathroom bathroom song time. I need to go to the bathroom. Okay, good luck. Make some bathtub into while you're in the bathroom, okay? I, something something to lower your blood pressure, okay? Good luck. Oh, my God. Yeah, I... Everything that's like been said has already been said. Uh, key takeaways, those were 100% ANCAP arguments, and I will defend that to death. Number two, um, if you don't give her the the easiest like platforming and softball question opportunity and ramble opportunity in her life you're being a bad faith debate bro um and then furthermore a complete failure to demonstrate how our system would work or a lack of introspection towards whether figuring out whether the argument that she's making against the current system would you know hit any less hard against her own specific system also just a bunch of terminology and concept misunderstandings nonprofit being one of them but yeah i yeah it's uh there's a lot of stuff here